the power of God, I, I don't know, but there are people God is raising to become mighty vessels. I just saw an anointing rest on you, this role. In the name of Jesus, I don't know where you are, but I pray may that grace now, let it rest upon you and shift you to a new dimension. In the name of Jesus Christ. Welcome to Christocentric Message. On this channel, you are going to get soul-lifting messages, faith-based content, prayer drills, and videos that would help you grow spiritually. Remember to subscribe to the channel, like the video you are about to watch, and comment on it. Stay blessed. Hallelujah. Amen. Hallelujah. Please help me appreciate Pastor Pojun. Thank you so much, your dear wife. Let's pray. Father, speak to our hearts tonight. And I pray that you walk mightily in our midst this night. To the glory of the name of Jesus. I pray, O oh God, that your word will come with power and with clarity. And I pray that the sick will be healed tonight. Let the oppressed be delivered. And let Jesus be glorified. In Jesus' name I pray. God bless you. Please be seated. It's my joy to again bring the word of the Lord tonight. We're looking at the subject of God's mercy. And I pray that the Lord would open our eyes the more tonight in Jesus' name. At my initial session yesterday, we began to talk about a few things. I want to make a very quick recap. Um, number one, I said to truly understand the subject of God's mercy, we will need to examine number one the nature of god that it is difficult to truly understand the subject of mercy until you understand the nature of god number two that you need to understand the nature of man there is something about man being the chief recipient of god's mercy you will have to understand the nature of man to help you understand his mercy Hallelujah. Theologically speaking or doctrinally speaking, you would need to really understand theology, the study of God, his nature, anthropology, the study of man, and then soteriology, the entire exegesis of the subject of salvation, beginning from the fall of man, for you to fully comprehend the subject of God's mercy. And um, we also discussed the fact that um, the mercy of God is predicated upon his love, his compassion. That the mercy of God is a derivative of his compassion, his love. That it is impossible to be able to show mercy until you have compassion. Mercy is the fruit of compassion. Are we together? Very important to understand this. And then we did establish yesterday how that there are two expressions to mercy. Number one has to do with forgiveness and withholding punishment from he or she that is guilty, worthy of condemnation, worthy of destruction. The first expression of mercy has to do with forgiveness and then withholding punishment from him that it is due. But the second expression of mercy has to do with alleviating pain. You have to understand that. It has to do with providing relief. And the recipient of that dimension of mercy does not have to be someone who has caused offense. Anybody who is weak, incapacitated, and not sustaining the ability to help himself is deserving of mercy from that angle. Are we together? It is very important that we understand this dimension so that number one, we can posture ourselves properly to be recipients of God's mercy to the fullest 
and then that in communicating mercy we know the dimensions that are required of us to give are we together until now the subject of mercy is always looked at from the angle of the sinner and one who is deserving or in need of forgiveness but that is only one expression of mercy if we approach mercy just from a standpoint of pardon and withholding punishment from the guilty it would not fully capture the essence of the subject of mercy so from a broad a broad perspective you see that everyone requires the mercy of god to make progress in life if the guilty and the sinner then you require pardon is that true and then if weak and inadequate you require strength that will be able to push you forward in the name of jesus christ the lord will help us tonight and um, i told us that for my session i'll be looking at two things number one the concept of mercy can you just put the volume down a bit please it's too loud thank you no not the volume of the keyboard now yeah hallelujah praise the name of the lord number one we have to understand the concept of mercy and then number two and that's what i'll be doing in this session the system of administering mercy i told us that it is not just enough to understand the concept you must understand the administration of mercy how mercy is administered from god to men and from men to men because if we only understand the concept we will appreciate it but never be able to experience it there is a spiritual technology for administering mercy and this is what i hope that we'll understand tonight in the name of jesus christ there is a weakness in man especially the fallen man by reason of the fallen nature and the consequences of the fallen nature upon man there is a weakness that is inherent in man that will perpetually necessitate the mercy of god if we are ever to thrive and rise to the fullness of our prophetic potential this has nothing to do necessarily with the fortitude to sin or to fall it is just an inherent limitation that is in all men the reality of the humanity of men the humanity of men you would notice in revelations and ezekiel also had that vision of what we call theologically the four living creatures these are a capture of the full dimensions that must find expression in man to fully reveal the glory of God. The four living creatures stand before the throne as a representation of all of the dimensions that represent holistic spiritual development. Number one is the face of the lion, talks of dominion and power and royalty but if that is the only dimension you know and have the side effect to manifesting that dimension alone is pride the next phase becomes a balance to the first phase the face of a calf that the purpose of power and authority is service are we together now but if you have these two dimensions alone it also has a side effect because being a calf alone will weary you to death so it reminds you with the third face that even though you are servant you are also human the face of the man it puts a balance so that you do not stretch yourself above and beyond your capacity and then when it reminds you that you are human chances are excellent that if you dwell on your humanity you will give unrestrained access to the flesh then it reminds you that although you are human you are also divine the face of the flying eagle so these are dimensions that must be captured in our christian experience to be balanced and to be holistic in our spiritual development but then i'm interested tonight for the purpose of our discussion on the reality of our human nature there is something about the weakness of man that if unassisted cannot produce the glory of god the bible is very clear as to the frailty of man we considered that yesterday 
that something about our weaknesses, our limitations, you find that expressly detailed in Psalm 51. Please give us Psalm 51. This was a, a very honest expression of the weakness of man. Can we look at that for a minute? Have mercy upon me, O God, according to thy loving kindness, according unto the multitude of thy tender mercies. He said, blot out my transgressions. Uh -huh. It's a long reading. Please be patient. Wash me thoroughly from my iniquity and cleanse me from my sin. For I acknowledge my transgressions and my sin is ever before me. For against thee thee only have i sinned and done this evil in thy sight that thou mightest be justified when thou speakest and be clear when thou judgest five behold i was shapen in iniquity remember we considered this yesterday and in sin did my mother conceive me. He's saying there is an inherent flaw that has nothing to do with me acting out any sin. There is a limitation that is enshrined in my humanity that cannot allow me to glorify God unassisted. The reality of the humanity of men is, is a factor that if not examined, we will never appreciate the necessity for his mercy and we will never also be able to rise to our full prophetic potential. If you're with me, please say amen. amen. God's mercy, therefore, is a system of advantage that was given to man to help man rise and bring glory to the name of the Lord in spite of all of these defects that are enshrined in men. God had to put in this factor of his mercy so that regardless the limitations of men we will still be able to birth the purposes of god are we together now yes by the provision that his mercy gives and provides we will be able to rise and become full expressions i wrote here of his expectations regardless our humanity so a quick recap that the mercy of God is a derivative of his love and his compassion. It is impossible for mercy to find expression without compassion. Hallelujah. Oftentimes you read in scripture that Jesus was moved with compassion. And I told us yesterday that mercy is an action word. You can feel the pain of another, that is compassion. But when it has to do with mercy, all through scripture, it is have mercy or show mercy. There is nothing like feel mercy in scripture. Mercy is always action. Hallelujah. But tonight, I am, I am particularly concerned about the administration of mercy. Because as powerful and as cheap, as free as the mercy of God is, you will be surprised that there are individuals in desperate need of his mercy who may never, never be able to receive of his mercy because they do not understand his system of administering mercy please follow very carefully my teaching begins now we need to understand how God designed his mercy to be administered several people have received um, for instance the COVID vaccine or any kind of vaccine at all when you come to receive a vaccine there is a system of administering it is that true yes you don't bring your head and say, can you put the syringe, just any part of my body. The most important thing is that it should get into my body. You may have a problem. Is that true? Yes, there is a system. So just because it is the mercy of God does not mean it works anyhow. We have to understand his system of administering mercy. And um, we find it scattered through scripture. Let's go to... Um, psalm 51 and verse 17 let me hurry for sake of time psalm 51 and verse 17 the bible gives us a very interesting condition that defines a spiritual state that a man must assume to be a recipient of god's mercy the sacrifices of god it says are a broken spirit 
a broken spirit. It says, a broken and a contrite heart, O God, thou wilt not despise. That means, God, in my studying you, I have found out that you are vulnerable to a kind of people. There is a kind of man that when you see, you cannot run away from. It's, it's almost like a, if I would use that expression for want of word, a weakness in God. That the psalmist in studying God, he found a weak point. That no matter how much God hardens his heart towards man, there is a posture spiritually that when you take, immediately you get his attention. And he says, anyone who assumes the position of a broken and a contrite spirit, he says, oh God, thou will not despise. Are we together now? So not everyone will truly and sadly be a recipient of God's mercy. There is a posture that any man must assume. Everywhere in scripture you see the administration of God's mercy. For running the delivery of God's mercy is brokenness. Please write it down. Brokenness is the name given to the spiritual state that any and every man must assume. To be a recipient of God's mercy. Psalm 34 and verse 18. Psalm 34 and verse 18. The Bible says the Lord is nigh unto them that are of a broken heart. He said and save it such as be of a contrite spirit. Is that in your Bible? The Lord. It is impossible for him to be far from those that are of a broken heart and that those who will experience his salvation expressed as his mercy are those who are of a contrite spirit. Now, scattered through scripture, the way we study scripture, as you know, um, the Bible essentially helps us to know God by um, revealing three components. Number one, the promises of God. Number two, the principles of the kingdom, what we call the mysteries of the kingdom. Then number three, prophecies. So every time you open your Bible to learn God, you find captured in scripture the promises of God, a representation of the boundaries of his commitment to the believer. Because God cannot be committed to the believer outside of the allowance that scripture provides. He is mighty and he is great, but he limits his dealings with men to the provisions that scripture allows. Are we together now? That means it is not just what you want that God does. It is what you want that is consistent with the provisions that scripture allows. And he has exalted his word even above his name. So you find promises. Number two, you find principles. The modus operandi of the kingdom. It gives you a capture of the ways of God. The methodologies of the kingdom captured in stories, captured in parables, captured in similitudes. So that when you study these parables and these stories, behind the stories are a revelation of the ways of God. Are we together? The Bible says the things that are written are for time. It says that they are for our learning. So that we through the comfort of scripture might find hope. Are we learning tonight? We're going to examine very quickly a story that captures, in my opinion, it is the most detailed capture of rebellion against authority and then how the mercy of God is administered. I want you to follow me very quickly as we go to Luke chapter 15 and examine a very popular story. We know it to be the story of the prodigal son. Luke 15. Let's begin our reading from verse 11. The Bible says, And he said, A certain man had two sons. Follow the story closely. The Bible says, And the younger of them said to his father, Father, give me the portion of goods that falleth to me. And the Bible says, And he divided unto them his living. And not many days after... The younger son gathered all together and took off his journey into a far country. And there wasted his substance with riotous living. 
There's no point to deal with this story and show you all the lessons that should be learned. But maybe I, I should just take a few seconds to explain something. This was the first decision he took outside the influence of his father. And it was disaster. That meant that all his results was credited to his connection to his father. The devil, knowing that his immunity and his strength was connected to his relationship, insisted to dissociate him from his father. And the first decision that he would take out of the influence of his father landed him in trouble. Same thing happened to Abraham and Lot. God called Abraham and the Bible says, and Lot went with him. The first decision Lot would make outside of the influence of Abraham landed him in Sodom. Hallelujah. Let's read on. Verse 13. The Bible says he went and wasted his substance with riotous living. 14 now. And when he had spent all, there arose a mighty famine in the land and he began to be in want. He went and joined himself to a citizen of that country and he sent him into his field to feed with swine. Look at the gradual degradation, degradation and decadence that was happening to this man. And then the Bible says, verse 16, and he would fain have filled his belly with the husk that the swine did eat and no man gave unto him. Next verse. When he came to himself. This is a very powerful revelation of what God put in men. The Bible never said the Holy Ghost spoke to him. The Bible never said an angel appeared before him. That means it is within the power of man to come to himself. You may not be able to help yourself, but you can come to the realization that you need help. Follow closely. This is the protocol of the administration of mercy. Please keep that scripture there. He came to himself and then he said, to who now? Himself. How many hired servants of my father's have bread enough to eat and to spare and I perish with hunger? Can you see that sometimes hunger is a blessing? Because it sustains a unique ability to make you come to... There would be no need for this kind of intelligent discussion if there was plenty. The Bible says he came to himself. Follow closely. Verse 18. I will arise. He's speaking to himself now. So he had that ability. I will arise and go to my father. And I will say unto him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and before thee. It took a lot of thoughtfulness to get to that point. To know the extent of his sin. That I've not just sinned against you. I have sinned against heaven and against you. I am no more worthy to be called thy son. Make me as one of thy hired servants. Say brokenness. Everywhere you find the mercy of God administered, you always find a broken and a contrite heart. Please keep that story there. Let's finish up. It says, I am no more worthy to be called your son. Make me as one of thy hired servants. 20. The Bible says he arose. He would have thought to himself and remain there. It is within your power to come to yourself. And it is within your power to begin to take a step that demonstrates brokenness. The Bible says he arose and he came to his father. Watch this now. But when he was yet a great way off, his father saw him and had... There you see our terminologies again. He never said he had mercy because mercy always flows from compassion. The father had compassion and ran and fell on his neck and kissed him. Verse 21. And the son said to him, Father, can you see that he was really determined? He said what he said to himself, he would say to the father. I have sinned against heaven and in thy sight, and I am no more worthy to be called your son. In the presence of such welcome from his father, many people would keep quiet and not say what they said they would say. But now he said, not even your honor would distract me. I am that broken. I have to let you know that I am broken. 22. But the father said to his servants, bring forth the best robe, 
This is the character of mercy. And put it on him. Do you know he never said bath him? He said bring forth. I don't care what condition. All that I need to see I have seen. There is brokenness. Bring forth the best robe. Put it on him. And put a ring. A symbol of authority. Put it on his hand. And shoes on his feet. And bring hither the fatted calf. And kill him. And let us eat and be merry. Why? For this my son was dead. What was the father talking about? Dead? What killed him? When you read scripture, don't rush. A man is talking to a son who is alive. And hear what the father is saying. This my son was dead. That means you don't need to die to be dead. This my son. There is a condition that is equal to death even when you are alive. This young man satisfied that condition that the Bible calls death. What is it? Separation. Is that not in your Bible? That God's idea of death is not just cessation from living. That once you are outside of your connection with your source, the word Abba means source, sustainer, defender, protector. Once you cut away, you are dead. This my son was dead. What was the death? He left me. And the Bible says now he's alive. What gave him life? The connection. Hmm. He was lost and is found. And they began to be merry. Are we learning tonight? 25. Now, we're about to learn another lesson. His elder brother was in the field. And he came and drew nigh to the house. And he heard music and dancing. Follow closely. Assume you are the elder brother. And he called one of the servants and asked what, what things, what these things meant. And he said unto him, thy brother is come. And thy father had killed the fatted calf because he had received him safe and sound. And he was, hmm. he was angry and would not go in. Therefore, came his father out and entreated him. What a good father. We talk about the children and forget the father. The father was good. Next verse. And he answered and said to his father, Lo, these many years do I serve thee, neither transgress I any time at thy commandments, and yet... Thou never gavest me mercy. How could I have been so close to you? As far as I'm concerned, I fulfilled the condition that would have made me a recipient of your mercy. And as close as I was with you all these years, in spite of proximity, I never truly benefited from your mercy. You can be so close to the point of mercy, but if you do not fulfill, he made one mistake. This was his mistake. I have served you and I did not transgress. It's called self-righteousness. So he believed that I am deserving of your mercy by reason of my flawlessness. He marked his script, graded himself and demanded an award called mercy. The father is about to correct the young man now. Are we learning now? And yet, you never gave me a kid that I may make merry with my friends. But as soon as this thy son was come, which had devoured thy living with harlots, and had killed for him. Look at how he's complicating. Are you seeing the detail? He's reminding the father, in case you have forgotten, let me help you understand the kind of person you are showing mercy to. He didn't say one who was feeding with the swine. He found the most dangerous part of the story and brought it before the father. Thou hast killed for him the fatted calf, 31. And he said unto him, Son, thou art ever with me, and all that I have is thine. Look up, please. He said, It was meet that we should make merry and be glad, for this thy brother was dead 
and is alive again. Remember his definition of death now? Was lost and is found. Let me ask you a question. How many of the man's sons were dead? Because we see that the results that followed those who die was bo on both the elder and the younger. The only difference was that one acted out his rebellion and his anger by leaving. The other one remained in the house but he was not broken. You need to understand this. When you understand this condition, you will know why so many people you pray for and say, Lord, are you blind? Are you not seeing this person? And yet it looks like they cannot. The condition for mercy is not service. No, he was serving in the house. The condition for mercy is not flawlessness. The young man did it. The moment the son satisfied that condition, I will arise and I will go to my father and I will say, Father, there is something I have recognized. My inadequacy. I have recognized my need for your influence. I have recognized that I cannot help myself. The father said, you've satisfied the condition. Stop. Believers, let me tell you, herein lies the mystery behind God's supposed commitment to the life of others. And it looks like God seems to handpick a few people. And you are wondering, God, why are you investing your time, your attention, your resources on this person? And I'm there and it's as if you are passing me. And I'm a Christian, I, I'm a churchgoer, I love you, I love my pastor, and it looks like things are not working. I show you the system of administering mercy. When the strength of God comes and it finds strength, it will go back. The strength of God comes looking for brokenness. Do you know what brokenness is? Brokenness is a state of admittance. Of your inability to help yourself out of your personal resources that you are inadequate by default by reason of the fallen nature you don't have to wait to act it out and learn a lesson from your pain that by default you recognize that if at any point you are unassisted by heaven the result will always be disaster so you don't have to wait until you act and then surprise yourself it is a revelation that is ever before you that God is not just a matter of Christianity. God is not just a matter of church. He is your life. If at any point you are separate from his influence, whatever decision that is made from that standpoint, like the prodigal son, like Lot, will always take you to disaster. Brokenness. The mercy of God is ever searching for brokenness. Brokenness among preachers, brokenness among business people, brokenness among all kinds of people. So you can find out that a young man can be smoking and drinking and lying down under a bridge and wondering. But in his heart he's saying, if there is a God, I know I do not deserve to see your face. Suddenly Jesus will leave a prayer warrior who is rolling in a room and come and appear before someone who is under a bridge and say, I am Jesus whom thou persecutest. If you do not know what God looks for in men to help men, we can continue shadow boxing in self-righteousness and hoping that we will find his help. Are we learning? In Daniel chapter 4, let me hurry for time. Daniel chapter 4, let's look at verse 34. This was um, the story of Nebuchadnezzar. Remember, he had a dream about himself and the disaster that was going to come to him. At the end of the days, I, Nebuchadnezzar, lifted up mine eyes unto heaven, and my understanding returned to me, and I blessed the Most High and praised and honored him that liveth forever. This was after seven years 
of becoming an animal remember he was so haughty he lifted himself and believed that he was god until he was turned to an animal for seven years this was the prayer of a repentant man watch brokenness even from a king are you ready and I praised and honored him that liveth forever, whose dominion is an everlasting dominion, and his kingdom is from generation to generation. Next verse, please. And all the inhabitants of the earth are reputed as nothing. And he doeth according to his will in the army of heaven and among the inhabitants of the earth. And none can stay his hand or say unto him, What doest thou? At the same time, my reason returned unto me. And for the glory of my kingdom, my honor and brightness returned unto me. And my counselors and my Lord sought unto me. And I was established in my kingdom. And excellent majesty was added to me when he acknowledged that truly there was a God above him. Let me tell you this. Many, many believers are unable to receive of the mercy of God because there is something about the nature of man that would not admit that you are limited. There is something about the pride of man, especially in the presence of seeming results. It is very difficult to admit I wish I had time would have examined the story, one interesting story in the Bible, the story of Jonah. When you read chapter 1, the Bible tells us Jonah's encounter with the Lord and he was sent to Nineveh to warn them of their sins. The Bible says Jonah ran away. He ran away and straight into the belly of the fish, he caused people to lose their properties. When you go to verse 2, verse 2 in its entirety is the prayer of Jonah. Jonah was praying in the belly of the fish. You see brokenness in the belly of the fish too. Is that true? And Jonah prayed unto the Lord, his God, out of the fish's belly. Let's look at 2 and 3. I cried by reason of my affliction unto the Lord, and he heard me out of the belly of hell cried I, and thou heardest my voice. And when you read on, you would see that Jonah continued to exp express brokenness. And the moment brokenness was in place, the fish could not eat Jonah again. It brought him out. Verse 3, God comes to him. Chapter 3, he comes to him a second time and says, Jonah, now you go and warn the people that in 40 days I'm coming to destroy them and um, let me show you what happened. Are you ready now? Hmm. He arose and went to Nineveh according to the word of the Lord. Now Nineveh was an exceeding great city of three days journey. Jonah began to enter into the city a day's journey and cried and said, Yet forty days and Nineveh shall be overturned. You will see why Jonah ran away from God. So the people of Nineveh believed God and proclaimed a fast. Shout brokenness. And proclaimed a fast and put on sackcloth from the greatest of them even to the least of them. For the word came unto the king of Nineveh and he arose from his throne and he laid his robe from him and covered him with sackcloth and sat in ashes. And he caused it to be proclaimed and published throughout Nineveh by the decree of the king and his nobles, saying, Let neither man nor beast, herd nor flock, taste anything. Let them not feed nor drink water. But let man and beast be covered with sackcloth and cry mightily unto God. Yea, let them turn everyone from his evil way and from the violence that is in their hands. Result, who can tell if God will turn and repent? And turn away from his fierce anger that we perish not. God saw their works that they turned from their evil way. And God repented of the evil. And that he had said he would do unto them. And he did it not. But Jonah justified. You, you see why Jonah ran away? There was something about God Jonah knew. He said, God, don't waste my time. I'm, I'm not ready to be insulted by these evil people only for you to now turn as though you were, I was a false prophet. 
I need punishment that validates that I'm a genuine prophet. And I know if this, if you find brokenness as evil as these people, only God knows how many of Jonah's relatives were victims of their wickedness. Chapter 4 and verse 1. Please go to verse 1. But it displeased Jonah exceedingly. And he was very angry. Why was he angry? Here's what he said. He's talking to God now. And he prayed unto God and said, I pray thee, O Lord, was not this my saying when I was yet in my country? Therefore I fled before unto Tarshish, for I knew that thou art a gracious God and merciful, slow to anger and of great kindness, and repented thee of the evil. Jonah said, there is this information I know. In my dealing with you, I have learned that there is a weak spot. When you find broken people, individuals, families, churches, territories, even nations, you can turn against your prophet for the sake of brokenness. Jonah said, I know this about you. You sent me and now I'm looking like a liar. What's that song? Overwhelming, never ending. Oh, he chases me down, fights till I'm found. Leaves the 99. I couldn't earn it. I don't deserve it. Still, you give yourself away. Oh, the overwhelming, never ending. You see, that Jonah was a genuine prophet. There was something about the nature of God he understood. He said, God, you are sending me to these people, don't waste my time. I'd rather run away. I know you. When you find brokenness, nothing can stand your mercy. So that it does not matter what my father did, what I did. Here's how the Bible puts it. If my people, which are called by my name, they will never see healing. No, just because I am merciful does not mean they will receive it. There is a condition on their own part. Number one, they shall humble themselves. Number two, they shall pray. Number three, they shall seek my face. Four, turn from their wicked ways. It says, then will I hear from heaven and I will forgive their sins and I will heal their lands. Here is the balance, believers, hear me. There are many people who believe that just because they are aware of the extent of God's love and benevolence, that awareness will immediately impart mercy to them. That is serious error. There are many people who continue to jump and claim the mercy of God without a state of brokenness. Here is the balance that we must learn. As powerful as the mercy of God is, there is a state. This is not only true for God to man. It is also true from man to man. How many people are so desperately deserving of mercy and yet you do not find brokenness in them? How many walkers to their bosses? How many spouses to themselves? How many leaders in church and business? How many people are so deserving of mercy? They hope that mercy will travel to come and meet them. The Bible says come before the throne of grace if you want to obtain mercy. You have to take the step. The prodigal son never met his father at home. But the father never met him in the place of his mess. They met somewhere in the place of his brokenness and obedience. If we want to experience the mercy of God in our lives, we must understand that it is a broken and a contrite spirit. Let me wrap up with one more scripture. Luke 18, let's read from verse 9. Jesus began the discourse in Luke 18, teaching on the ministry of prayer. Remember, 
he spake a parable to the end that men ought always to pray and not to faint. And then he gives the parable of the unjust judge and the weak woman. Then when we get to verse 9, verse 9 now, he now talks about the danger of self-righteousness. Watch this carefully. He spake this parable unto certain which trusted in themselves. Are you there? That they were righteous and despised others. So this was the morale of the parable. He was teaching the danger of self-righteousness. Verse 10. Two men went up to the temple to pray. They were not doing evil. It was prayer. One a Pharisee and the other a publican. The Pharisee stood and prayed thus with himself. Ready? Hear the prayer of the Pharisee. God, I thank thee. I am not as the other men which are, number one, extortioners, unjust, adulterers, or even as these publicans standing by my side. He's talking to God now. I fast twice in the week. I give tithes of all that I possess. And the publican standing afar off would not lift up so much as his eyes to heaven. Who is speaking here? Jesus. Jesus is teaching something. When Jesus is talking, you listen to him. He is the wisdom of God. He lifted his eyes to heaven. He says, but smote upon his breast saying, God, be merciful unto me, a sinner. I tell you, this man went down to his house justified rather than the other. For everyone that exalted himself shall be abased. And he that humbleth himself shall be exalted. Still Luke chapter 18. Let's go to verse 35. And it came to pass that as he was come nigh to Jericho, a certain blind man according to luke's account he calls him a blind man other synoptic accounts would give him the name blind Bartimeo. and a certain blind man sat by the wayside begging and hearing the multitude pass by he asked what it meant follow carefully now and they told him that jesus of nazareth passed by and he cried saying, Jesus, thou son of David. Please finish it up for me. He never said heal me. Because healing is an expression of mercy. The entirety of the healing ministry is God's expression of mercy. The man was not clear what exactly he needed. But he knew that whatever it is, that would be the cure for my weakness is under the department of God's mercy. I told you that there are two expressions of mercy. Do not forget. Number one has to do with forgiveness and providing pardon. Is that true? Over one who is guilty, an offender, but that there is another expression of it that has to do with providing relief for one who is weak, one who is beggarly and incapacitated. Every one of us here under the sound of my voice will require one or more of these expressions for the rest of your life. Hmm. Please, let's finish up the story. Luke. He cried saying, Jesus, thou son of David, have mercy on me. The Bible says, and they which went before rebuked him that he should hold his peace. But he cried so much the more, Thou son of David, have mercy on me. And Jesus stood. Are you seeing that by this singular act, Jesus confirmed that he was an expression of God? Because remember what the psalmist said, A broken and a contrite heart, O God, thou will not despise. So if Jesus was truly the invisible image or the, the express image of the invisible God. He should not see brokenness and pass. So he stopped and commanded him to be brought to him. When he was come near, he asked him, saying, 
what will thou that I shall do unto thee? It looks like sarcasm. What should a blind man want? And he said, Lord, that I may receive my sight. Here's what he said. Receive thy sight. Thy faith has saved you. Immediately he received his sight and followed him, glorifying God. And all the people, when they saw it, they gave praise to God. Mercy. Have you seen that everywhere you see the manifestation and the administration of God's mercy to individuals, to nations, to territories, it always comes in response to brokenness. Therefore, if you embrace brokenness as your default state, now you understand what Jesus was saying in his Beatitudes when he said, Blessed are they that hunger and thirst. He was not finding joy in their predicament. He was, he was trying to describe a state that if you are aware of your inadequacies, you will always be filled. It's a reward. Listen. Ask any man of God, ask any businessman, Ask anyone who has experienced the grace and the glory of God in their lives, their ministries, and their endeavors. If they are to be honest with you, they may not even be able to articulate the basis of such investment of God's attention upon their lives. I'm giving you the theological explanation that there is something about their work with the Holy Ghost that has brought them to a perpetual state of brokenness. Brokenness is not self-condemnation. No, not at all. Brokenness is a state of awareness. Was this not what happened to Isaiah in chapter 6? When Isaiah beheld the glory of God, here's what he said. He said, woe is me for I am undone. He said, I am a man of unclean lips and I dwell amidst the people of unclean lips. For my eyes have seen the king, the Lord of hosts. As a result, he was now ushered in to experience the mercy of God. A, one of the, the cherubs, the seraphs, had a life call and he touched him and he says, your iniquity has been taken away from you. Believers, I don't know about you, but you see this man standing before you is a product of God's mercy. When I hear people brag and celebrate their achievements and everything, I stand back and I know that in all fairness, would I be honest with myself to credit the results on my life today to my performance connection? Is that true? Would I be honest? It's not just because I've read it in the Bible. I am aware of the limitation of my state sociologically, etc. You see that? Be careful. Lest when you build houses, Deuteronomy chapter 8, it was a warning. When everything is in place for you, that you will say, my power and the might of my hand, that is the side effect of success. That it is possible that when you succeed and the spotlight is on you, it becomes embarrassing to credit the honor to another. There is something about men and our each and desire to be celebrated. Why would I turn the attention of the world to me, we say, and now suddenly turn it to another? Huh. Let me tell you this. There are men and women that will rise in these end times. You will add them up and see that as an equation, they don't add up. You will look for where the wow factor is and not find it. It's hidden in the mercy the mercy of God invested in their lives at the instance of their brokenness. You will see entrepreneurs rise that when you sit and talk with them, you will feel you are wasting your time. Yet you cannot deny the results that come from their lives. Because behind their frailties, there is the jealousy of a great God backing them. You will see this in preachers. You will see this in ordinary men. You will see this in mothers. You will see this in children. Listen to me. When you understand the entire theology of God's mercy, 
then you will now know how to be merciful to others you will know what to look for also in administering mercy so no one just blackmails you spiritually show mercy no i must like god find brokenness if i do not see brokenness there is no point communicating mercy I was glad when they said unto me, the Bible says, let us go to the house of the Lord. You only find this in the house of God, the wisdom of God that strengthens us. Now as a leader, as a businessman, you know what to find in administering mercy to your people. Perfection is exhausting and unnecessary. Search for brokenness. Among the many factors that you put as your basis for lifting people, if you do not find the component of brokenness, do not waste your time. A genuine, broken, and a contrite heart is what God looks for. Question. When we make the altar call, why do we oftentimes ask those who have admitted to stand up to come and stand before everyone and make that declaration? Does it really make any difference spiritually if they just sit back there and you say, well, here is this prayer. Go home and go and say it between you and God. Does it stop him from hearing? All that they do, that entire activity is just a way of helping them to establish their brokenness before God. So they come and stand. Are you ashamed of him to stand before men? Hmm. You see why that coronation happened for Jesus? It was not just because he was Lord. Find out what happened to him. Philippians chapter 2 from verse 5 puts it very expressly. It says to permit this mind to be in you which was also in Christ Jesus. And then it says verse 6 as we wrap up. It says who being in the form of God taught it not robbery to be equal with God. What happened? Watch this. He made himself of no reputation. Watch the protocol now. And took upon himself the form of a servant. And was made in the likeness of men. And being found in fashion as a man. He humbled himself. Here it is. And became obedient unto death. Now you understand our concept of death. First separation before cessation. Of living as far as the three dimensional realm is concerned. Even the death on the cross. The death of the cross is how cursed people die. Wherefore, because that condition of brokenness was established, do you know that when Jesus walked upon the earth, he never called himself father? Jesus. He acknowledged perpetually that there was an authority above him, even as Jesus. He was comfortable being called son, Messiah, not father. I can of my own self do nothing. As the word he did not think it was an embarrassment that even though his original name was and still remained the word and that the Bible says without him was not anything made that was made. Yet, he would say, I can of my own self do nothing. By reason of that brokenness, please back to Philippians chapter 2. It says, wherefore, God had so highly exalted him and given him an office that is above and greater than any other office. And then it says, at that name, every knee should bow of things in heaven, things in earth, and things under the earth. And every tongue should confess that that Jesus who was the Christ at his baptism has now become Lord. The office that was given to him is Lord. The absolute owner. So the psalmist by the spirit says the earth is the Lord's and his fullness thereof. He sits in that office not just as Christ but as Lord. This was the message of Peter on the day of Pentecost. Let it be known to you that that same Jesus whom you crucified has today been exalted as Lord and Christ. I show you a mystery. And a deep secret in the spirit. Behind the mysterious rising of many. 
behind the investment of God's jealousy and power and grace upon seeming people who are seemingly not qualified. In all your diligence, in all your being productive, in all your contending for knowledge, in all your executions, remember that there is a state of inadequacy in man that our very best is still short. I believe in productivity. I believe in diligence. No visionary leader will use the subject of God's mercy to produce laziness out of his people. No. The subject of God's mercy, if not understood, will make it look like there is no need to be productive. There is no need to submit yourself to learning and all of those things. I told you that the mercy of God is a system of advantage that is based on the awareness that the best of man has been examined with time and it has still been found to fail. Yesterday, I wrapped up with a scripture in John 21. The Bible says that how Peter said, I go a fishing frustrated by the transition of jesus or the death of jesus he said so i don't do two zero since i lost being a disciple let me go back to what i was doing i go a fishing and they said we go with thee the bible says and they went forth and entered into a ship immediately and that night they caught was peter a good fisherman help me was his boat fine was his net well where do you find fish so he was in the right location with the right tools having the right mind yet no results there are times everything is right yet no results if you want to find fish you should be at sea if you really need to catch fish you should have a functional net there are times oh businessman there are times oh man of god there are times oh family man that from the standpoint of men's system everything is in place Yet you will surprisingly not catch fish. At that point, you do not need your skill again. Leave the boat and look for Jesus. Jesus looked at him and said, Little children, have you any catch? You, Peter would have been angry to say, I'm older than you. Little children, your age mates were killed already. So everybody who was older than Jesus was older than him by at least two years. He said, Remember his, old, his age mates were killed? Now he's calling Peter, who is married, little children. Peter said, I accept. I am a child. Because if I'm not a child, I should understand the dynamics that will be able to produce fish. And since I am that incapacitated, your verdict about me will not be taken for an insult. I accept. He was ready for fish. He said, cast your net to the right side. Since you passed that test and you're not insulted by my assessment of your weakness, cast your net to the right side. The Bible says he cast his net to the right side and all of a sudden he caught fish. Spare me a minute or two as we wrap up because someone came to church wondering, Lord, I love you. I've been around church. Remember the elder son. I've been around you. What is it about me that I've been in this church for five years and I may not have that much testimonies? A stranger comes in and before the sermon is already crying. And he lives back with his healing. He lives back with his breakthrough. Two weeks after Wafbeck is returning with, with a buffet of testimonies. I show you the missing link. Could it be that you have not understood that the best of man is still limited? The mercy of God provides forgiveness, pardon for the guilty and for the sinner. But it provides a system of advantage to remedy for your inadequacies and remedy for your limitations by reason of wearing a mortal body. This is what makes him a high priest who has compassion. I define compassion as the ability to be touched with the feelings of our infirmities. Jesus today is seated at the right hand as a man. Not just as God. He went with his body. The man, Jesus. And he makes intercession because God does not pray. Only men pray. Prayer is for men. So Jesus can pray because he is still in heaven as a man. He makes intercession for us. The basis of his intercessory ministry is the fact that he has felt 
the reality of our humanity. There's no record of God being hungry. But when Jesus walked upon the earth, he was hungry one day. He looked at a tree that lured him. He came thinking green grass meant fruit or green leaves. And not finding any, he cursed the tree. The Bible did not hide the frustrations of Jesus. The Bible did not hide the limitations that even though God. One time he came to the temple and found men buying and selling. He whipped them. It's in your Bible. Jesus was angry. He wept at funerals. He was sad. The reality of that human nature. Now he captured that experience together and he's seated at the right hand. So he can tell the father, I know what it means to stand alone as a preacher from a family where nobody believes you. I know. I know what it means. Brothers and sisters, it is on the strength of the awareness of God's mercy that we are also strengthened to communicate mercy to others the fortitude for mercy will not just come because you read it in scripture you must have illumination and understanding there is something intrinsic about the nature of man that should not surprise you again the best of a man is still flawed all it takes to reveal that flaw is time remember the story i gave us yesterday the woman caught in adultery the conviction started from the eldest, the one who had lived longest. No wonder our loved ones, the older they become, they become like children. All their anger of youthfulness just erodes with time. Because by the time they are 60, 70, 80, their life is full of stories and memories. And they can look at you over something and say, just go, it's all right. My time is up. We're going to do two things. One, we're going to pray and ask the Lord to perpetually keep us in a state of brokenness. Brokenness means that you acknowledge that unassisted by the help of the Spirit, you are inadequate and your best is still short. And that when God finds brokenness, you are ready to be a bona fide recipient of his mercy please rise up on your feet or whatever position you find comfortable because please lend me two three minutes may i request so that we pray i don't know how you are going to talk to the lord tonight many following online i'd like you to cry to your maker and my maker do not make the mistake of praying the prayer of the pharisee he came as an arrogant one to stand before god and was listing all his human credentials in hope that those credentials will find him a space in God's mercy. But there was one who came standing from a point of brokenness. Lift your voice in one minute. Cry to he that hears the prayers of broken people. It says, if I cherished iniquity in my heart, the Lord would not have heard me pray. Oh, the overwhelming, never-ending, reckless love of God. Oh, it chases me. It leaves the 99. I couldn't earn it, and I don't deserve it. Still you give yourself away. Oh, the overwhelming, never-ending, reckless love of God. Make sure you are praying. Are you praying? Let it be from the depth of your heart. I come before you with brokenness. With the awareness that unassisted, there is frailty in my nature. That will not allow me bet the purposes of God accurately. It is based on this understanding I come to you. Are you praying? No shadow you will light up. Mountain you will climb up. Coming after me. No wall you won't kick down. Lie you won't tear down. Coming after me. 
Shalabako Sada Brande Kete Malako Sitaya Shaleka Praske De Belenda Ko Shalab Ragadu Siata In the name of Jesus Christ In the name of Jesus Christ Can I speak over your life And that also doubles For those of you who are trusting God For one healing miracle or the other I just want to take a minute to speak over your life. Healing flows from his mercy. It's a system of advantage to preserve your body because the body must be prepared to serve his purposes. Therefore, I stand in partnership with the grace upon the angel over this house and I decree and declare for as many who are following, watching from around the world and those who are here, you are trusting the Lord for healing. Help those under the anointing. In the name that is above all names, I decree and declare right now, let the healing power of Jesus touch your body now. I minister the life and the power of Jesus to your body. Be healed in the name of Jesus. Be delivered in the name of Jesus. Be healed in the name of Jesus. Be delivered in the name of Jesus. I decree and declare that from tonight and all through this year 2022 in the name of Jesus may your life be an evident display of the mercy of God in the marvelous name of Jesus Christ your life will be an epistle that will help many learn the mercy of God in the name of Jesus Christ and as a church family i agree with you in the name of jesus let it be for you from glory to glory and from grace to grace in jesus name i pray amen god bless you and thank you so much dearly beloved i hope you were blessed by this message do not keep the video to yourself share to as many as you can to help them bless Check our home page for more of our messages, subscribe to the channel, comment on it, like it. See you on our next video. Bye! Pray! Pray! Pray for your destiny! the face of development. Lord, grant me the discipline.